The time has come for Indiana to provide access to pre-K education. The governor lays out his legislative plan for 2014. Expanding education is a priority, but can taxpayers afford it? We'll take a look at all his proposals. Organized labor put up a fight against a right to work and lost. Now new leadership is taking control. What it means for every Hoosier holding a union card. And our political insiders take on the hot topics of the week right now on Indianapolis This Week. From RTD6, the Indie Channel, this is Indianapolis This Week with Rafael Sanchez. Welcome to Indianapolis This Week. I'm Rafael Sanchez. Governor Mike Pence is laying out his legislative agenda for his second year in office. Among his plans are proposals to invest more money in infrastructure, increase access to education, and cut taxes for businesses. RTV6's Katie Hines explains. The governor says his agenda, a roadmap for 2014, builds on the momentum Indiana has already gained. The time has come for Indiana to provide access to pre-K education for all the disadvantaged children in our state. Governor Pence's agenda includes several education initiatives, like the establishment of a voucher program for low-income families. He proposes increasing the number of charter schools and creating a fund to support teachers who work in low-performing schools. It's been a lot of talk in recent years about parental choice, student choice. Well, I think it's time to give teachers some choices and, um, and, and be able to choose where they want to teach without worrying about losing the pay that they've earned. The governor's agenda includes a $400 million investment to expand the state's highways. He also proposes phasing out the business personal property tax. We look at neighboring states. Uh, it's, it's very clear that the fact that Indiana has a business personal property tax on the books uh, represents a, a disadvantage. Improving the quality of the state's workforce is a priority for Pence through investing in training programs. And while the proposed amendment to ban same-sex marriage in the state constitution has gotten a significant amount of attention, Pence says the conversation about family must go beyond the definition of marriage. We must make it possible for more families to prosper economically. I think the time has come for us to put a priority in our tax code again on raising children in the Hoosier State. What remains to be seen is how the state will pay for the initiatives at the Indiana Convention Center. Katie Hines, RTV6. So you heard from the governor, now Democrats are responding to his agenda. This is what House Minority Leader Scott Pilath had to say. Unfortunately, there's a potential to uh, shift the tax burden to consumers and to workers and to the middle class. And there isn't necessarily a demonstrable uh, benefit to the business tax climate. Uh, joining us now are two of our political insiders, Democrat Kip Tu and editor of IndiePolitics.org, Abdul Hakim Shabazz. The governor has supermajorities in both houses. Will he get everything he wants? No. Uh, no governor uh, gets everything that they want. There will be give and take. There will be negotiation. One of the interesting things... Shouldn't he get everything he wants? I mean, he... <laughs> <laughs> no. I mean, no. Because we don't have government by fiat. We have a democracy and uh, separate branches of government. It'll be interesting to see what happens with that business personal property tax. Because a lot of folks aren't crazy about it. But the trick is... How do you replace the revenue? Because a lot of that goes to cities and towns uh, to provide services. We live in a world of property tax caps. So I don't think anybody will do anything without some sort of replacement revenue. Can you sell this? Well, there are some interesting ideas there. Uh, I have to say that uh, some of them are very good ideas. Uh, I, I personally think that business property tax, personal property tax is not an impediment to job creation in the state. We have the lowest per capita taxes, I think, for businesses in the Midwest, and it's not done anything to spur job growth. So I don't think that this one more hand out to business is going to do, mu do much good. The governor did not do enough, I think, in his uh, legislative agenda to reach out to the middle class uh, to help working folks. I'd like to see some of that. I think that's what you're going to hear from the Democrats as the legislature begins. But the focus on education, I think, is uh, very good, very strong. Uh, don't agree with vouchers, of course, but uh, we definitely need pre-K. You know, everyone always wants to have more, give more money to the young people. Like, kids, kids are cute, but can we afford... <laughs> 
<laughs> right? But can we actually afford any more money going to education when already more than half the state's budget is spent on education? The, the trick will be to see exactly how they do it and what do new revenue forecasts uh, come in at, and that kind of goes to the national economy. One of the tricky things is, because the governor, he wants to expand charter schools, which I'm all for, and pre-K vouchers. The, the trick is, is going to be from Kip's friends, we're going to be complaining that we're taking money away from traditional public education. Of course, I would argue just empowering parents to pick the right schools for their kids. Well, you know, I do think there, that you are going to hear that uh, from our side. There's no question about it. But the greatest investment, long-term investment we can make is in pre preschool. It makes the biggest difference long-term. The question is, do politicians have enough will to invest on something that's going to take longer to have a return on and that investment. And pre-K is the one subject that he and the school's chief, Glenn Ritz, actually agree on. That's right. Everybody, everybody agrees on it, but of course the trick is always how exactly do you do it. And remember, once again, one of the problems with early child education is a lot of the results are lost by the time the kids get to third grade because you have parents who didn't put their kids in early childhood education. So what does the governor have to accomplish? A lot of talk that he may run for president, he may be a vice presidential nominee. What must he accomplish in this session? I think the big thing is more job creation, things that put more Hoosiers back to work and how well do they use the legislative session to continue to close that skills gap that's going to be the big thing i think he needs to concentrate on indiana and not concentrate on his national profile i think politicians who spend all their time thinking about the next political office make big mistakes in that they don't focus on what they should he needs to grow indiana's economy he needs to prove to national voters that he can handle this state and speaking of the economy on friday we saw the job numbers come out the numbers are much higher than expected will the president get uh an embrace from the Republicans, or will they say that this is all our agenda? Well, I saw a report that said most of it was from the federal uh, sequester, not sequester, but shut down all those federal employees coming back, go, go, coming back to work. So we'll probably need to see a couple more quarters before anybody can claim victory or, or point at defeat. The world is also now paying a lot of attention for the next couple of days on Nelson Mandela, who died at the age of 95. Your thoughts on that? He came to Indianapolis in 1993. Yeah, it, the interesting thing for the from the Indiana angle is the relationship with Richard Lugar. Um, if you will recall, um, Back in the 80s, when uh, we were, uh, when when Richard Luger was attempting to uh, help end apartheid, he had to uh, shepherd through Congress an override of President Reagan's veto of the sanctions against the um, white government of S South Africa. And it's a shame, of course. Now Richard Luger lost a Republican primary, but one more instance of his statesmanship with Nelson Mandela. Mandela himself, I think, will go down in history as as most people say, as as one of the great leaders of the 20th century. And do last word. Nothing more. more more interesting than being an 18 year old college student in DeKalb, Illinois, and watching on your small black and white TV Nelson Mandela being released from prison in 1990. Something I'll never forget. They're the best in the business. Our conversation continues with our political insiders on Twitter. You can check out their Twitter hand handles and give us your opinion and stay up with Kip, Abdul, Lara, and Jennifer throughout the week. Coming up next, the leader of the AFL CIO who fought against Indiana's right to work is now out. After the break, we're sitting down and talking with the new president of Indiana's Union Voice. After an unsuccessful campaign to block passage of the state's right-to-work law, there's a new leader taking over Indiana's biggest voice for unions. Joining us now is Brett Voorhees, the new president of the AFL-CIO. He takes on his new role after serving as president of the Central Indiana Labor Council since 2000. 11. Welcome to the program. What does your leadership represent now for the union? I think that, that, that what, uh, what I have and what I bring to the table for labor is actually bringing people together. Um, for far too long now there's been a division, um, not a division because of labor dividing itself, but you know there's been a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, proponents out there um, during legislation and, and um, corporations that have been trying to divide us. So what I plan on doing is bringing the movement back together, revitalizing the labor movement. A uh, right to work was seen as a setback for the labor union. Can you recover from that? Oh, absolutely, we can recover. I mean, you know, yeah, there are a few wounds, but you know, it's still too early yet to tell. You know, um, the exact impact that it has had on us. Um, you know, we don't, we haven't, high, we haven't lost any you know members, big numbers, or anything like that yet. So, and basically, I mean, we all know that right to work was just a political attack to weaken unions. So let's talk about that because in the Indiana State House right now, there's a super majority, mm -hmm. which one some would say the party in power does not favor for unions. How do you change that shift? How do you change those minds if, in fact, the power at hand may not like what you're selling? Mm -hmm. Well, what we have to do is, and when I say revitalize, we have to go out and we have to we have to hit the streets. We have to we have to educate the general public on what the unions are about. We need to let the general public know that we pave their streets. We, we 
deliver their mail, we pick up their trash. Um, you know, there's a number of things that we do every day that the general public doesn't understand. Once the general public gets a better understanding of what we do, um, then in essence, you know, hopefully we'll, uh, that'll, that'll go on to the legislature and, and their districts and, and move on so that there is a need for unions instead of trying to weaken unions. And in Indiana, we've seen a, a growth in manufacturing jobs and that many of the folks that join unions are in that sector. But in this 21st century economy, how do you convince uh, a 21-year-old or a 30-year-old who may not have a good opinion or may not mm -hmm. know about unions that they should be a part of one? No, we just have to educate them. I mean, we have to educate them on, on what the union's actually about, you know, what, what, their, what their collective bargaining rights are, you know, um, how, we, how we bring the 40-hour work week to them, um, how we bring their overpay to them, or overtime pay for them, but only that, but only having a job, the job security, knowing in a year or two years or three years exactly how much money you're going to be making, what kind of increases you're going to be making as well. And you have that protection. How challenging will this be for you? Do you have a timeline? Is this a, a five-year process, a ten-year process? What's your strategic plan to get this accomplished? Yeah, you know, it's you know, I, as far as a, a timeline process, it's really hard to tell. It's going to be tough. Um, there's a lot of challenges ahead of us. Um, we've been stagnant and um, for a long time now um, within the movement here in Indiana, and um, and it depends on on the solidarity that, that we all come together, how quick we come together, and what we can do, and when, how we can reach more out to the public. And and I, to be honest with you when we're down at the legislature, you know, reaching out to both sides of the aisle. Um, you know, not just because there's an R or a D or an I, but to, to actually show the benefits of being a union person. The last time we saw you in large droves was for those rallies because of right to work. Mm -hmm. Where, how will we see you at the state house beginning in January? And how will we see your presence in this election cycle? Mm -hmm. Well, we will be, we'll be well represented at the legislature. Uh, we'll be lobbying for... In those numbers or seeing videos from those protests, will we have that kind of presence, that, that kind of voice at the legislature no, there will listen be, to us? No, there, will, there won't be big rallies or anything. You know, I plan on myself and, and working along with other um, af, um, other affiliates with their lobbyists there as well and working on any, any legislation that does come about that not only affects unions but affects, you know, working people in general. Brett Voorhees, thank you so much. Come back again. Thank you, sir. We're following uh, everything you do for the next couple of months and, and years. Thank you so much. Thank Appreciate you. it. The development of downtown Indianapolis is taking a big step over the next five years. The Velocity Plan was unveiled and it calls for some big changes. We're talking about them with Indianapolis Downtown Inc. right after the break. Indianapolis Downtown Inc. is celebrating 20 years of work with the Circle City by unveiling a plan called Velocity. This week, the five-year strategic plan was unveiled. One of the projects would redesign University Park between the Indiana War Memorial Plaza and the Federal Building, making it more active with areas for kids to play. Another proposal puts a massive bike and pedestrian bridge over West Street to open up downtown to the IUPUI campus. Indianapolis Mayor Greg Ballard says the city is changing to meet the growing demand for those who want to live downtown. And the trends are quite clear. People want to be able to walk to shopping, to restaurants, and to entertainment. They want to be able to step outside their door and be surrounded by arts, by parks, by local businesses, and more. They want to feel connected to their neighbors and to their neighborhood. And the trend is also clear that people are quickly re realizing that they can do all of this in Indianapolis. Now, according to the Indiana Business Research Center, Indianapolis is expected to add more than 140,000 new residents in the next 25 years. Joining us now is Bob Schultz. He's the Vice President of Marketing and Communication for Indianapolis Downtown, Inc. Welcome to the program. Is Velocity doable? Absolutely. This is a five-year strategic action plan, and we uh, brought in 4,000 voices to help shape the plan. Many times, strategic plans are done in the boardroom, and some the conversation just stays within staff and board. We open this to the community. What are the priorities we need for downtown? We've been a commerce center. We're an incredible events destination. What do we still need to do to make downtown more, more whole as well as more successful and sustainable? And residential seems to be the conversation. Is that the priority? I mean, of all the things you have to accomplish over the next five years, which it seems somewhat daunting, what is the priority in that plan? Well, I, I certainly think it is. It's re-looking at downtown as a resident center, as a residential magnet. Clearly, the demand for downtown living is at an all-time high. So we have such new talent and energy moving into downtown. Millennials, as well as empty nesters, bringing in significant income not only to our 
to our county, but also to the state. These are people moving newly into the state of Indiana and are doing it in downtown Indianapolis. We often hear from those who live in the corners of the state, mm -hmm. whether South Bend or Fort Wayne or Evansville. Why do we keep talking about downtown Indianapolis? Here they go again, another right. plan. But the reality is that the center of the state, the capital city, is the economic engine. That's Am I right. wrong about that? Or no, you are absolutely right. In fact, 43,000 jobs per square mile in downtown Indianapolis compared to 66 jobs per square mile average across the rest of the state. So we know it's an economic engine that's driving our state uh, and it's certainly understandable as you look at, you know, Indianapolis gets everything or whatever. Well, it doesn't, you know, and obviously we, we are a driver of, of the economy, but there are, there are great destinations all around the state of Indiana. We just know, let's continue to invest in what's working and that's downtown Indianapolis. If you draw all these families here, about 140,000 in the next mm -hmm. couple of years to Indianapolis, do we have enough stuff? to sustain that well, kind of and that's, to the that's certainly what the plan looks at is is trying to identify what are those residential amenities that families require that empty nesters require what do you look for in your neighborhood so what do we need what are we going to see more restaurants are we going to see more parks are we going to see more yes 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 street level retail dog parks places for children to play in uh, downtown indianapolis in downtown well. indianapolis a dog park yes so that's some of the conversations we're taking you know we we think about that as like we take that for granted in our in our suburbs is a place to walk the dog, run the dog, whatever, place for children to play without uh, fear of running into the street. That's necessary in downtown Indianapolis as well. The city's in the middle now trying to bid for a Super Bowl. Right. Does that, that bid process, that, does that distract from a plan like this or does this plan help that bid process? Well, and this, this plan also recognizes the value of art, sports, and entertainment in the downtown energy. So going after a Super Bowl realizes we have the, the, uh, the amenities necessary to bring large-scale events to town, but as you know, you don't build a church for Easter Sunday. So we can't always be talking about what are that, what's that next great big event. We will because that is what makes uh, Indianapolis known so well across the world, but sustaining that momentum in between those major events, we need to build our residential base as well. This past weekend you had a major event, the Big Ten Championship game. Is that part of this as well? I mean, how do you get those crowds to want to maybe move here, right? We have people in from Michigan and Ohio. That's right. Come, come, come live in Indiana, right? That's right. And so they're exposed to the, the walkability, the connectivity of our downtown, the energy, the, the street level uh, retail. They're exposed to the, this dynamic sports town that we have. And by doing so, they're saying, you know, I may want to be a part of that. Or my business is thinking about expanding or relocating. I want to be a part of downtown Indianapolis, and we want to welcome them. Bob Schultz, thank you so much. Absolutely. Merry Christmas to you. We do appreciate that to you. Thank you. There's plenty to do in downtown Indianapolis in the 12 days leading up to Christmas, each day offering a free activity. Everything from free ice skating at Pan Am Pavilion to free admission to the Children's Museum. You can check all those details online on our website, theindychannel.com. After the break, find out how you can help some needy children and their families with a brighter year this holiday season. <laughs> We're getting into the holiday spirit of giving here at RTV6. Look for us on Monument Circle next week at the RTV6 Toy Drive. We'll be collecting toys from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. on Thursday, December the 12th. You can donate new unwrapped toys or cash and help make a child's Christmas. Or you can bring toys anytime between now and December the 17th to the RTV6 studios here on Meridian Street between 13th and 14th Streets or drop off donations at any AAA office in central Indiana. And joining me now is the man behind the toy drive, our very own chief meteorologist, Kevin Gregory. Now, if we come to the circle next week, you promise no snow, right? And if we do have snow, you don't have to get out of the car. So you drive by, roll down the window, we'll be happy to grab the toy and thank you, of course. And we're helping kids up to 12 years old. And so what happens, these 10, 11, 12-year-olds, the big kids, oftentimes you mentioned you can drop off cash. That becomes extremely important right at the end of the toy drive because we can target the buying for the need that's left. Oftentimes we get for the younger kids, say this four to eight year uh, range, but the older kids obviously uh, benefit too. So and we we've helped thousands. And we could use more toys. Oh, you can always use more toys. It, it's pretty amazing through the community agencies. Uh, these families will be qualified to receive toys and the need is great. 
If you just listen to the radio, there's so many great organizations sure. out there doing many great things within the community. This is just one of those. So we thank you for your support. That's an easy day next Thursday. I'll also mention we'll be in Carmel at the AAA location. There's nine locations you can always drop off at, but we'll be there at uh, Carmel AAA Way for toy drive drop-offs. And it's so amazing to see the parents because they actually go shopping for their child to pick up those toys. I mean, parents really that are in need really need this, Kevin. And you should see the benefit to the givers. Yeah, I mean, awesome. how much they enjoy it. Uh, Access Recovery and Recycling put together about 14 bikes. They they not only bought them, they assembled them, That's and awesome. the guys loved it. They, sure. ha they have the patience for assembly, Raphael. Yeah. Kevin, thank you so much. And see? Hey, next time, since you're so tall, can you just squat for me? I'll just relax. Thank you. Kevin Gregory, you're amazing. Thank you. Thank you for watching. I hope you'll enjoy join us next week for another edition of Indianapolis This Week. When you stand by next to Kevin Gregory, you just get flustered. I'll see you next Sunday. Thank you for watching.